Good morning, Discovering Discos. Welcome to another Tuesday Discover More episode, where as the name suggests, we give you even more to discover. From deep dives on hot topics to expert guests and exclusive interviews, we leave left leave nothing left undiscovered. We are your hosts, Natalie and Tara, and today on the podcast, we are bringing you a very special episode with Director of Food Safety Research and Testing, James Rogers. James is responsible for leading the food safety and sustainability operations of consumer reports, including food testing, data analysis, and risk safety assessment. As head of product safety testing, he also oversees the team that assesses the safe operation and use of consumer products. So welcome to the podcast, James. And thank you for the invitation. I look forward to the conversation today. Yeah, we are very much looking forward to it too. Um, you know, right before we got on, it, it does feel like we are in an era where a lot of I mean, this, things are always in the news, but it, there is a ton of focus on food and questions about what is in our food, ingredients, and like so many things that are just at the forefront of a lot of people's minds right now. So we um, are excited to dive into that, but I do want to like start a little bit before that. I would love for you to give some background about like Consumer Reports, what it is, how it is organized, you know, like where does your funding come from? All of those things I think are really important for setting um, the framework for the rest of our conversation. Oh, I'd be glad to. So I've been with Consumer Reports going on eight years now. Um, I came to Consumer Reports from the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service where I performed baseline studies. I was uh, part of the chief scientific officer office um, uh, did the Federal Regulatory uh, Committee of NACMETH, which is the um, big group that deals with food safety issues. It includes industry, academia, federal offices um, to set food policy and, and methodology and so on and so forth. So when I came to Consumer Reports, um, it is now 87 years old, approximately. It is independent. It is does not rely on any type of advertising, um, and we are the voice for consumers. We have, as I said, like 87 years of history of testing things, testing stuff. And one of the first issues of Consumer Force, if not these, the first issue included testing milk. So it has a long history of food safety, food quality, nutrition, um, and so that's what we do. We are funded by both memberships and donations um, in the area of food safety. We've gotten a couple of small grants for testing, but we're primarily funded by internal funds um, for uh, food safety, nutrition, and as you mentioned, I do have product safety under me. Um, I just want this to be noted, James. You didn't realize this, but I make it a goal of mine to bring up dairy and <laughs> and you did it within the first episode. three so minutes. Thank you for James, doing it for so. me. Um, I'm really. <laughs> that's actually fascinating, though, that yeah. you started with yeah, and I was being one of the first products. And one of the things that we do do is we buy where the consumer buys. So all of our products, even the cars we test, the washing machines, the cell phones, we buy them at retail. And then we test them because we want to be as close to the consumer experience with these products as possible. So um, the, the consumers will know if we find it, they have a chance of finding it too. And if we didn't find it, they have a chance of not finding um, it either. So. I, ha I have a question after that, but I want to know, I'm excited to hear that you had USDA background because I think that's something that we want to dive into later on in the conversation. And so... Um, I think this just got even more interesting okay. and exciting for me, knowing that that, you know, is part of the history you had before coming over to Consumer Reports. But on the note of you saying that, you know, part of the way Consumer Reports works and is structured is, you know, you're on behalf of the consumer, you're advocating for them, you're looking out for their interests, you're purchasing the products they have. The question I had is how do you guys choose what to you know, invest, look into, like, how are you choosing? I mean, every single week on the podcast, Tara and I are out searching the news, you know, weeding between the articles that we think, you know, is applicable to agriculture. How do you guys make that choice at Consumer Reports of what you're going to, you know, spend time studying and looking into? Okay. So Consumer Reports is, it has three main areas, testing, which is the area I'm in, advocacy, which can advocate for changes in consumer law that supports nutrition and safety, 
and then content. They're the ones that write the stories. They're the ones that put our postings up on the website, um, et cetera. So it's important to know that structure first. When it comes time for us to test, what I do is my team and I, we go into the literature and we see what are the reports saying about risky foods, okay? And so we do a literature download and we review the literature. We also talk to the food testing laboratories that we work with and we ask them, what are you seeing coming through the door that may be like right below the, the, the level of concern, but you know, you're seeing X in this particular product and, and they'll say, you might want to consider testing this, right? So the first is risk, right? What are the riskiest things that are happening? What's happening to the public health data, et cetera. The second thing is what do we think will resonate with the consumer? So the beginning of last year, we actually did a survey on social media to ask uh, younger people, right? Younger consumers, if you were a consumer reports, what would you test? What are you concerned about in food, nutrition, et cetera? Um, then we also look at if we've tested it before, is it time to test it again? So when I first started consumer reports, we tested baby food for heavy metals. And then a few years later, after we reported on it, we found some baby food that had too high of heavy metals, giving the manufacturers a chance to fix it. Then we will retest again if the products are still available. And sometimes they'll pull the products off the market if they don't think they can make a certain level. And so we throw all that in, put a little bit of secret sauce and mix it around. And then we decide the top three or four projects that we're gonna be able to test for that year based on resources, money, time, et cetera. But then I also keep some money behind just in case something happens because in the food safety world, there's always something happening. So last year, I had some resources behind when the applesauce tainted with cinnamon that was tainted with lead came up. So we immediately were able to go out, purchase some of that applesauce and test it for lead levels. And so, like I said, every year something happens. If I have some money left over and I can test it, we go out and get it as quick as possible um, and test it to try to respond to consumer needs and what they may be interested in or concerned or worried about. I was listening to, I'm totally blanking on his name and I should not be blanking on his name because I listened to his podcast and he's very famous, but um, he's on Seinfeld. You were on. Um, oh, Jason Alexander. Yes, yes. You were really on there talking really about microplastics and that's when yes. I was like, oh gosh, he would be such a great interview for Discover Ag. Um, and, you know, I was going to bring this up later <clears throat> in our you know, conversation today, but I think we're kind of here, you know, this, this just made me think of it. So I'm going to bring it up now, but mm -hmm. there was a recent mm -hmm. panel, um, before Senate, um, uh, RFK jr, um, hosted it along with, you know, a handful of other hand selected people and microplastics mm -hmm. got brought up in it. And I remember one of the responses, cause they were talking about the science, which is obviously what a lot of this conversation with you today is going to be about. And, uh, the microplastics got brought up and someone had alluded to, you know, they're still doing a lot of research on, you know, they're finding it in, you know, mm -hmm. plethora of places they listed placenta, you know, blood, sperm, wherever they're finding it. And they said, they're still doing a lot of research in science. I mean, I thought it was a great answer because he did say they're still doing a lot of research in science to understand like, it, what this actually means, you know, these levels that they're finding um, so that we can properly, you know, portray that to, to the community. But I thought it was interesting. He then said, do we need science to tell us that microplastics in our brain is bad? Right. And so I find something that Tara and I go back to all the time on this, this podcast is kind of this mm -hmm. science portion of food conversations versus this emotional gut instinct we have as humans mm -hmm. when it comes to food. And I feel like they're always at heads and that's where the two arguing, you know, activists on both sides, the two extreme cases come from because one says we don't have science that says there's anything wrong with microplastics in our body. I mean, it's going to be a natural response to all the plastics we have, you know, and, and that they can advocate that side of the argument very well because there's there's no science and that's what they look for and then you have the other side who said what that guy said do you really need to be told that microplastics in our brain is bad i mean that doesn't sound natural and so i'm so curious 
you know, you can answer it specifically to microplastics or you can take it bigger scope. But I'm curious where you fall on that being kind of in the scientific community and having the background that you have. Okay, it's going to be a little No, that's okay. I'm sure we'll lead to further Please conversation. So that will be great. <laughs> okay. 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 So let me put my public health person hat on first. Okay. I think it's important that you use science as the structure to answer the questions because science tends to have naturally, if you do it well, the tools and the parts that can give you an answer, yes or no, okay? So if, if I say my concern is not that the microplastics are there, but what are they doing to the body? If I want specific answers about what is it doing if it is found in the placenta or the lungs or the kidneys, that also helps me try to mitigate or to treat or to prevent different things from happening too, right? So the, the public health part of it will say, okay, microplastics is there. What are the problems that it's causing and what can we do about it? Okay, so that, that, that's one answer. Let me put the, the, uh, the chemist or the microplastic hat on now. Okay? We published, and I talked about it with Jason Alexander and his partner, that not only are we concerned about the physical pieces of the microplastics, but we're also concerned about the plasticizer chemicals. And we did a testing for that in food, and I talked about how these microplastics, these pieces of plastic, not only could be a physical problem to the human body, but also a chemical problem because they could be releasing these plasticizer chemicals. And so a effect that you're seeing because the microplastics are there may not be because they're there, but it's because they're releasing what they're releasing. And different plastics have different chemicals in them. And so you could have, for instance, microplastics of a certain type found in the placenta that don't have these chemicals and you see no effect. And then you could find the microplastics in the placenta that do have these chemicals and are releasing and seeing an effect. And so unless you do the science, you'll say, wait a second, there's two different answers to that. It's there, logic may say to you, or emotion may say to you, it's a problem, but you don't know which it is. Is it the chemicals or is it the physical piece of plastic there? So I think using science to answer the question is very, very important because when you find confusing data, like I just described, or you're trying to figure out a way to treat or to prevent or whatever, it will help you determine how important of a problem is it? How many resources should we throw against it? What resources? Because the first is a, a physical problem, that second is a chemical problem. So you gotta figure out which of those resources to throw against it, to try to resolve it and to fix it, right? And so that's why I think using science is correct here for this problem. So. You're not wasting time. You're not wasting resources. You're getting people treatments if they're needed as soon as possible because you know what the problem is and you're not just going off of gut instinct or reaction. I hope that answered your question. I actually have two questions from that and they're very different. So we're, and I want to ask them both because I think they're very important and I think our listeners are probably wondering both of them, thinking them. And so we're just going to have to bounce. Yeah, we're just so going to have to bounce notes between again. them. I'll, I'll ask them <laughs> one at a time, but it's just okay. going to, we're just going to bounce between them. Okay. My first, you know, as we talk about okay. all of this, and I'm going to say this in like the nicest way possible. At what point do you think the consumers lose, the average consumers lose the ability to understand the nuance into some of these answers. Like you said, there could be, depending if you're pregnant or not, it, you know, okay, if we pick one example, uh, baby food and lead or something, depending on the age of the child, depending on, you know, the, the amount of it, the form of it, like there's all these different examples. And then the parents see, well, you can't have it in this form because that's bad, but you could have a little of it in this form. Like, where do we lose that detail on an average consumer that, you know, a scientific brain can easily process and put together and go out into the real world world and make those choices. And at what point do you think we're just adding maybe more confusion for the consumer to distort through or even more distortion where they see, you know, it's, you can't have it at this level 
and they start wondering, well, why can you have it at that level? So it must be bad or someone must be lying if I can have it here, but not there. Do you kind of know what I'm saying? Like, where do we, where do we lose that detail that it causes actually a little bit more problems or does it not? Let me give you a little bit of my own personal history um, and I will get to your answer. I promise. So when I first started out, my, my intent was to become an academic and do basic science research. But if you look at my LinkedIn, I've been all over the place professionally because I just had different interests. If you would have told me 10, 20 years ago that a lot of what I do, which is a lot of what I do is interviews like this podcast, or when I spoke to Fox News today about the McDonald's and hamburger is consumer education, right? because I felt that somebody needs to talk to people about these issues. And I'm one guy in the windstorm, but I try my best to try to break it down so that uh, regular people can understand it. And so if my wife, if my children can understand what I'm saying, they're all adults, then I think I've accomplished, accomplished it by explaining different food safety, food regulatory concepts. So I totally get what you're saying, which is one reason that if you read Consumer Reports magazine, even though we're talking about stories that started out very high level, right? I mean, I have three PhDs on my staff, including myself. So our research is science-based. My testing is science-based, but then we have to break it down so people can understand it. So if you read the magazine stories, you'll see we try to explain those things about um, uh, the hazards, the concerns, the problems, et cetera. And you also will see that we use a lot of graphics. So we say you can eat this much of this product, but maybe this much of that product. And so if you look at the tables and the graphics that we use, we try to do use colors, red, yellow, green, um, to try to explain about consumption. But I think it's also a national issue too in that we don't educate our people um, either in schools or in just in general about these issues at the level that they can understand it, right? So um, for instance, again, I mentioned about the diversity of the country. We don't have, we put our articles out in um, Spanish, but then other cultures cannot read our articles because they may not be able to read English or Spanish, for instance. And so I just think we have to be able to get this information to them in bite-sized pieces that they can understand whether it's going to be in the future an app or it's going to be education in our school systems or it's going to be public service announcements. I don't know what it's going to look like. I may not be around to see what the final version is, but I think we have to figure out a way to get it to the level where, and I'm not going to say lower, but get it to a level and in a format that people can understand and then take action, right? Modify their diets or know where to go for the right good information. And I know we're going to talk about social media in a minute. Um, but I just think that's something we have to do as educators, as regulators, as communicators, we have to figure out a way to get this information. To yeah. And I think a lot about trust too, because sometimes if you can't make sense, but you have like a foundation of trust, then it's easier for that. The outcome that, you know, should be conveyed at the end to take form. If they're like, it doesn't make sense to me why I could have it in this product, but not this, but I'm going to, you know, trust this regulation, mm -hmm. you know, then the, out the outcome is achieved. Um, okay. So my next question goes to, you had alluded to the baseline of the safe amount for something, the baseline amount, the regulated tested amount. I find in a lot of conversations, I get a little frustrated because people will not trust that number, right? So Tara and I have had conversations about like the dirty dozen before um, where people, you know, there'll be scientists who will argue, well, sure, there is, you know, a pesticide on that, but it's below, it's been tested below the safe regulation amount. And there will be a community that will say, I don't care. Like, I don't trust who, who's this number? Where does this number come from? So can you, um, and maybe this is too wide of an answer because maybe they come from a, a zillion different sources, you know, but could you break down what that, where those numbers are coming from or, or lewd, you know, shine some light on those regulatory safety limits so that maybe people can trust them a little bit more when you are using them in conver conversation? 
Well, again, that, that is a very common question. <laughs> I am very good at answering, <laughs> asking questions you cannot give a straightforward answer to. I know. Yeah. No, I, I know, I, I know, I know. I'm just giving answer. you a You time. did, you did. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Let, 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 me, let me use my experience with the F, uh, USDA Food Safety Inspection Service of the Baseline Surveys Director. Okay. And in a nutshell, what we did is set a baseline. So we went and let's say chicken, whole chicken carcasses, we would collect the carcasses, sample them and determine how much salmonella and campylobacter were on chicken carcasses. Right. And we did that for a year to take care of seasonality fluctuations and all that. We went to small producers, we went to giant producers, whatever, and we set a baseline. So we said that on average, you would detect X number of salmonella or Y number of campylobacter on a chicken carcass, right? And so let's say it was 15 colony forming units or 15 bacteria per chicken carcass. Let's just say that, okay? And that the number didn't vary from a small producer or a large producer. Let's just say that's what it was, okay? So you have set a baseline. You then go to the public health data and you say, can you determine how many people would get sick if you serve them a chicken carcass that has 15 bacteria on it of salmonella? And you can determine, you know, if they get sick. So then the USDA would say and come to the chicken folks and say, okay, we're going to allow you to have 14 bacteria, but if you go to 15 and above, it makes too many sick. So then we're going to regulate you at that point. So you're trying to base your levels, your regulatory level, not only on what are you seeing in a chicken plant, but also what you think is going to cause people to get sick. Okay. And it's based on collecting data, doing the surveys and all the rest of that. Does it change? Sometimes it does. But you have to set a baseline level and you have to tie it directly to some public health event, illness, death, et cetera, to say, if I set this level, this is the goal. If I set this level and we're below that level, the number of people that get sick goes down. right? But if it's above that level, it may go up. And sometimes it's based on what the industry could achieve. So if I go to the chicken uh, council and I say, and I'm USDA and I say, well, I want you to be at, at below 15 bacteria per chicken. They may say, we can't do that, right? We may have to come up with some other sanitizer or, or something like that. We can't do that. So then sometimes there could be a negotiation. Well, we, can do, we can do 16 and we'll get to 15 next year. Right. So it is data driven. It is, in my experience, usually based on public health outcome. And it can also be based on what can the industry do now? And then let's set some aspirational goals to what maybe you can do in the next year, five years, et cetera. So can they trust it? I think that from a federal regulatory position, I tend to trust our regulatory agencies to determine those numbers as long as they're using the most up-to-date and accurate data and that they are bringing in subject matter experts to help them. Um, that's why we have these uh, uh, federal advisory committees that are combined with industry and with academia or whatever to help them work on questions like this. And because you have people in the room that um, care and that want to give the best type of levels that you want to set, then that's probably the best you're going to do than if you only relied on academia or only relied on the producers or only relied on the federal government to come up with a number. So that's the best way I think it, it can be done and, and should be done. But I also think it should be done more often because sometimes they set a level and they don't revisit it for years. So it, it should be a much more rapid no much more mm -hmm. um periodic review yeah no that makes a lot of sense and thank you for um using a specific like example like that to kind of shed light on it because i do think that that's going to be very very helpful for our listeners um 
before, you know, we close out here, there is one other thing I want to talk about. Um, you mentioned it earlier on with California and food dyes. And right now I think food dyes is just hot in culture, <laughs> social media, you know, consu mm -hmm. consumer facing concerns with food, you know, the food babe coming out of that Senate. She is, mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar with her, she's a kind of a food activist that is, you know, petitioning. Okay. Yep. Oh, so, yeah, you know, you, she's doing work, you know, with Kellogg's right now against food dye. And so I just think it's such a hot conversation. We've covered a couple of times on the podcast that I think it'd be a missed opportunity if we didn't kind of mm -hmm. dive into, you know, what you guys have seen, you know, what you have studied, um, from the consumer report standpoint and, and your guys' stance or, you know, what you have learned about food dyes, um, through your, through your research. And we're not going to talk. Yeah. About <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> We'll see. I mean, we might have to have a part two here, James. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because uh, my nutritionist, Amy Keating, and I yeah. are very concerned about that. Okay. But we'll, we'll talk about food dyes first. Okay. So if you look at our history, um, we have tried to petition to get food dyes, um, certain food dyes and chemicals in general out of our food. And so... You may have seen that back in August of this uh, month that California signed uh, Bill 2316 about getting um, six different um, chemicals out, food dyes, red dye number 40. I have to read for a list because I can't remember it. Yellow dye number five, yellow dye number six, et cetera. Okay. Why do we do it? Because these chemicals have been associated with uh, causing neural behaviors and uh, problems in children. And um, because, again, as I said, the FDA had not reevaluated these products and their safety for decades, right? And there's new science and new ways to test, to quantitate, et cetera. Um, the other thing is that we tend to get more movement at the state level than at the federal level. As you and I said, it takes forever to get something done federally. So the hope is that if we can get like a big, gigantic state like uh, California to ban these in, in food, that either the rest of the states will follow through. And there were some other states, I think, like uh, New York and Indiana that's been doing it, too, um, will also ban them. And eventually either Kellogg's or other producers that have these food dyes in there will say, well, why do we have to make two different products, one without the dyes for California and one with the dyes for the rest of the country, that there'll just be one product that does not contain these dyes, right? I mean, there's some reports, for instance, in Europe that they banned these, some of the dyes like red dye number 40 years ago, and they use other colorings. And so if Europe can do it, why can't we have the same safer food, not safe food? And so that's the main reason why we do it, because we have asked the federal government that please reevaluate these from a safety standpoint. But if they're not going to reevaluate them, let's just ban them, because at least the data we're seeing from researchers, academics, other public health folks say that they're not. Good so you think. People. So that's kind of the that's kind of the the move. Now, I have not studied the food babes. Um, because she's on Instagram, et cetera, it's hard for me to get a grasp on the actual papers and paperwork and stuff that she does. So I can't comment on her and her recent activities. But I know from a consumer report standpoint, we think that getting these chemicals and food dyes out of food is an important thing. And Brian Ronholm, our director of advocacy, crisscrossed the country from D.C. to California to help support this ban in California. So we um from the you said else. you know you guys haven't studied it but from the data and research you guys have done you feel like there is scientific support to say that food dyes are harmful to the human bodies yep yes yes we do i know natalie said uh, we were going to close plus, out plus plus real quick real quick yep. plus again as i mentioned they're banned in the eu right and they have data too to suggest that these chemicals should not be in food too. So we're not alone in this and people who are advocating for fewer and fewer chemicals, dyes, etc. cetera. Um, there, there are people that have a scientific background who've done the research, who looked into the public health data that say the same thing. We just may not have taken the same type of pathway as this particular person did. 
Yeah, so a question that I have had that it's in this space. I know not. <laughs> we do this a lot on our podcast. Out, but I, we're I gonna do want to touch on social media. Like, I know. I'm so really okay. sorry. <laughs> But I think it's an important conversation to have because when you were at the very beginning of this conversation, you were talking about what Consumer Reports does. I kept thinking, how do you get this information out to people? Do you like just publish it and then media picks it up? You obviously do like interviews like this. Like, you know, are you tapping? Like in my mind, I thought to myself, are you tapping influencers? And so I do want to have a conversation about what role these social media influencers play into this because this is a big point for Natalie and I. I mean, we come at it from the agriculture side. A lot of times there will be influencers they will speak on things about agriculture and it can be very misleading it can be you know even misinformation and then it it, it goes viral you know and then you have this mi- misinformation out there and like trying to roll it back from your standpoint is there like a healthy balance of you know the the social media influencers of the world bringing attention to this is there misinformation they're putting out there that ends up fear-mongering people like i guess where does consumer reports and, and you land on this conversation Okay, so I'm going to take it two different ways, nutrition and safety. Okay. My nutritionist, Amy Keating, she's a registered dietitian. She and I have been taking up the call at Consumer Reports that we really have to address it because we're kind of in a a tight spot because we recognize that using social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, X, etc., is important for us to get our, our messaging out. And in fact, when we do a food safety story, it could go in the magazine, it could go on our website, it can also, they will also generate social media postings about this too. Like I did a lot of social media when we did chocolate, chocolate one and two, we did stories. I did a story on don't wash your chicken, <laughs> got in a lot of trouble, right? So, so we see the, the things you get in trouble for on social media. Right, I know. I, I warned them yeah. too. I said, we're going to get flamed for this. Just get ready for it, right? Um, so we have to use that tool, number one, to survive as an organization, but number two, to get our messaging out. But if, and we have worked with influences too, but we have to be also very careful as to who we choose, um, et cetera, because they have to understand the brand. They have to understand the mission. They have to understand the product. And so we have used influencers, but, you know, very carefully chosen. What Amy and I concern is with social media influencers that we don't control is a couple of things. Number one, especially in the area of nutrition where Amy swims, the terrible information, false and inaccurate information that they put out, they don't, many of them don't, some of them do have a a dietary uh, background, but many of them don't. They're being paid by these companies to put out information and it's very false information. For instance, Amy sent me this thing about, you know, all carbs are bad. That's not true. Right. Or that a certain oil, if you use it, it'll kill you. That's not true. Right. And how do we counteract that bad information? We haven't figured out a way that would not take both of us every day calling someone out on social media. I mean, because I was, you know, saying, well, we should call out the Kardashians and the flat tummy tea because we don't know what's in it or if it works or whatever. And people say, you don't want to do that, you know, if you want to make more enemies. Okay. <laughs> so we're really, really concerned about that. And so when anyone asks us, where should we go for more information? We always say, come to our stories. We'll include the links, but also go to the FDA, the USDA, the CDC websites for information and we try to point people to additional information that we trust that we would use uh, to draw our conclusions. But I understand what you're saying because it scares us that this bad information gets out there. And on the food safety side, you know, I always bring up the example of this woman who was making this stuff called uh, pink sauce, but had no idea about food safety and was shipping it to people and whatever. I think she even got a cease and desist from the FDA, you know, but how many people could she have potentially gotten sick? There would have been, wouldn't have been no recourse because you can't sue her, right? Um, And you can't get any money if you get sick, right? And so um, that is really, really concerning for us. And I think, you know, we're kind of like at the early parts of this, this phenomena, but I think we really should put things in place right now Like if you're getting paid by a major food manufacturer to support and purport that this is good stuff, you need to let us know every time, 
right? And if you're putting out bad information, there needs to be a way to get it off. Like there was one study I just read where 75% of the products that these influencers were suggesting in Germany was high salt, high sugar, etc. And so we already have a problem with obesity and maybe they're making it worse, right? So i um, really concerned about that. Not sure what the... I know. It's the million dollar question. And I think something we just talked about on the podcast is it, it is easy for us, you know, as we're viewing content to see things like you said, oh, well, that person's getting, you know, paid partnership with Coca-Cola or whatever. Like that's pretty easy to be like, okay, there might be bias introduced there. But Tara and I got into the conversation. What about when that person has their own personal ebook that they're selling that's like, buy my book instead. You know, I mean, there's layers of incentive that we forget about, or just even the idea of a viral post, you know, to say something to just go viral. I mean, Tara and I've had that conversation on the podcast so many times when it comes to tick, you know, the TikTok landscape where we're like, people just will put anything out there with no credibility, no understanding because they just want to pop off and have a viral moment. And like, what is that doing for the conversation. And so, like you said, it is kind of an open-ended question because there's no really, you know, answer or resolution to it, but it's great to see that like, you know, other people kind of have their ears perked up to like, what is this actually doing to the overall landscape moving forward? Um, Especially for, you know, children coming behind us as they start to make form relationships with food and, and are buying and, and shopping. So thank you for that. Yeah. My, 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 um, Second in command, Sanaa Mujahid has a daughter, I think she's four or five years old. She has literally taught her how to read food labels. And so before, before she reads any candy or whatever, she looks for red dye number three, red dye number 40. And if she sees it, she sets it to the side, right? And so that's really baseline education of a child. Now, you know, her mother's in food safety, but that's a baseline education of a child that you would hope would carry along the way to say, well, let me read, let me learn, let me figure this out. And then let me understand whether what I'm seeing on social media is true or trustworthy or whatever. So I said before about education, basic education, um, she's doing that with her daughter, you know, and, and that to me, that's an example, a possible, possible start of how we can, you know, make people food skeptics. Maybe, you know, asking the question, oh, I'm going to lose 50 pounds in two weeks with this. Mm, maybe not. So, yeah. no, I'm glad you brought that to like a personal level, because the last question I do want to close out with is, is bringing it on a personal level. I mean, you obviously in your job are bombarded every day with information about what is safe, what is not, what are the risks? How do you like not get overwhelmed? And I would love if you, is there like three things that you're like, or however many, like uh, some big ones in your life that you're like, once I learned this, that was it for me. I cut this out. I encourage my kids to cut it out. My wife, like, you know, that it was like, I will not like stand for this. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just those big things in our life that like, that would be, you know, helpful for our, you know, listeners moving forward that could be like, okay, these are some changes that could have an impact and, and make our lives, you know, healthier, better, safer, you know, kind of the words we think of when mm-hmm. in these conversations. Um, well, the first question was, how do I, uh, <laughs> I pull out my You're like, yeah. I shave my yeah. head, so there's no um, <laughs> hair to pull out. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, so I understand that it's a journey. And I also understand that I have my own personal limitations because whatever I do, I have to fit it within my budget, my capabilities, um, et cetera. And so, um, and then if I do have to disconnect and disengage, I do, right? Or or I will, like I said, I have four PhDs on staff, three. Um, And so I can shuffle it off to other people too, if I have to. I mean, like Sanaa, I just mentioned, PhD from Cornell is a listeria expert. So whenever we have questions about listeria, if I don't feel like I can handle it or I have the time, she's a listeria expert, let her handle it. And then I have two chemists, right? When the chemical stuff comes up. So I have the resources to be able to say, okay, time out, it's time for someone else to step in and do this, right? Um, Regarding the two or three uh, biggest things that I I figured out. So I did my postdoc in the lab to work on toxin producing E. coli. And once I learned about that, I stop eating my meat rare. Um, I use the meat thermometer. I encourage everybody to use a meat thermometer in my family. I make sure they make me, they see me sticking it in the turkey leg or the breast or whatever when I'm doing Thanksgiving dinner. So just doing basic 
common, easy to adapt food safety things um, uh, helps me along, right? Second thing is, is that I have no problem throwing stuff out once I can find data to say it's bad, whether it's the food, whether it's all the plastic containers that I've accumulated from Chinese restaurants or whatever. So I'm not tempted to use them to microwave or whatever. So I just said, okay, if, even if I paid a lot of money for X, if it's shown to be bad, if I'm convinced of the data that's bad, I'll get rid of it and replace it for something. So uh, the health of myself and my family is important to me and so i'm going to do whatever it can whatever i can um and then i guess the third thing is that i try to read a lot and be aware but i don't let it scare me um, because i do know that for instance a lot of food safety issues especially the chemical ones etc are chronic they're not acute um which means it's going to have an issue over time and so you have a chance to stop it, hopefully, before it gets really, really bad for you or you have accumulation of things or you have the effect of long term exposure to something. And so because a lot of what we study at CR are of the more chronic, then that gives me hope that if we get this information out to me or to consumers, there's something that they could do about it before it gets too bad. Right. And so I think those are the biggest the three biggest things that, that through my career um, working in food and water safety, et cetera, that, I, that I've looked at. Now, I have worked on things that are acute. I have worked on different bacteria like 0157 and viruses and stuff like that, that, you know, you got to deal with this like right now. Uh, but there are also things that, that are not that, I'm not going to say not that bad, but not something that you have to take care of right now, but you can work it into your lifestyle, into your behaviors um, to hopefully ameliorate it and reduce it and it reduce its effect. On I appreciate that. You know, there was a couple of times throughout, <laughs> it's kind of funny that this is what came to mind for me, but there was a couple of times when you were speaking throughout this conversation that, um, for whatever reason, my brain actually went to the quote. Um, I think especially when you were talking about, you know, a mother teaching a daughter, right. And, you know, power within the household. But I went to the mother Teresa quote, um, obviously her says like, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. But I couldn't help like kind of twist the words and think like, if you want to, you know, change the world, like start within your own home. And I think when it comes to food for me, it always comes back to that because it is so personal. And so for everyone tuning in, you know, it, I think it comes down to, as you kind of said a couple different times, like finding what's important to you and your family to pay attention to make those changes within your household that you can for you and your family and then kind of tuning out the noise outside of that. So um, thank you so much for your wisdom today. We really enjoyed sitting down with you. Um, I know our disco community is absolutely um, going to love what we talked about um, and appreciate um, your opinion to um, a lot of the different things we talked about today. So once again, thank you so much. And for everyone tuning in, we will see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>